So I want to welcome back Layla Ananda and Sue Hansen. They were our presenters at the January session. After that session, um, we, we needed more time to continue this complicated and important topic of the discussion of implicit bias. So uh, welcome back to Sue and Layla. Um, as you may recall, Sue is a psychotherapist with an emphasis in treating the whole person. Layla is a psychologist, educator, and musician. Both of their work is um, focused on increasing awareness and action and around racism. And both of them work with a variety of organizations, but both of them do work with the Interface, Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice. Um, I have placed the presentation that they used in, um, at the January session. Um, I'll send that around in the chat so that you can refer to that. I just sent that around. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Layla and Sue. So again, welcome, welcome to everybody. Thank you so much, Gail. So let's, let's actually arrive here. I see people, you know, popping in and we come from a lot of different places, a lot of different things on our minds. So I want you to just kind of take some of those things and just let them float gently down to the ground. Let them rise up, float gently down to the ground. Feel your feet on the ground. Feel where you are seated, where your body is touching the chair. Notice, but let go of any sounds in the room. Feel the air moving over your skin. Now notice what's happening with your breathing and just let it continue in this way. Go ahead, Layla. So we want to do a land acknowledgement. Ann Arbor is on land originally inhabited by the Ottawa, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Wyandotte people. We acknowledge that we continue to benefit from access to land originally gained through the exploitation of indigenous people. And we're aware that of the care these people gave and continue to give to this land. Knowing these things cannot change the harm done, but a thorough understanding can empower us to create a future that supports human flourishing and justice for all individuals. Learning all we can of Native American historic and present situations is something we can start with. And we thank Chelsea One World One Family for that description. So we're going to go into breakout rooms. Um, you heard the introductions. Um, some of you we met before, um, some of you are new. Um, but we're gonna give you a chance to introduce yourselves to just a couple of other people. You, can, um, you will get to know, this is a small group, so you'll get to know the others. Um, but we want you to, um, to focus on a question, which is what is, implicit bias and how is it different than stereotyping prejudice and racism, or is it? And I'm putting that in the chat and you're going to have about seven minutes. So, you know, it's going to be a little bit brief. We can't go into to a major thing. We'll return at, we'll return you to the room afterwards. Okay, so um, thank you all for taking the time to introduce yourselves and talk about the question and what we'd like now to do is spend a few minutes um, giving we won't have time to hear everybody but just a, a, probably just a handful of people who might like to share something that they discussed and the answer to the question um, about how implicit bias is different than stereotyping prejudice and racism or is it and also feel free to um, 
put any thoughts in chat and we will share those as well. So um, anybody like to start? Who's brave? Well, I'd like to show <laughs> to, <laughs> to um, uh, have my uh, partner in my room, I'd like to throw her under the bus. She had a wonderful definition of implicit bias. And I apologize, Margaret, but uh, we talked, we did a lot at introduction time, so we didn't sadly talk a lot about the um, subject since we weren't exactly sure how much time we had. But anyway, if Margaret would be willing to share her definition, I thought it was a really good one. Well, I like Nancy until now. <laughs> um, I we we spent a lot of time on introducing ourselves, talking about mediation and how mediation had its different forms, and it that compared a tiny bit to peacemaking. And so when we got around to implicit bias, neither of us really knew what the difference between implicit bias, prejudice, racism, or um, I forget the other stereotyping. Pardon? Stereotyping? Stereotyping was. And I said, well, just looking into it a little, a little bit, it seemed like um, implicit bias was more narrow in that it was an immediate and natural aversion or favorability toward one person or one group. And it seemed that the other three concepts were much broader and less specific, but that's as far as we got. So, sorry. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. That's a good start. I think I saw Phyllis put her hand up. Is that right? Please go ahead. Okay. So what what we came up with was we thought that the stereotyping, prejudice, and racism was was a little more of a choice, whereas the implicit bias might be more um, internal and uh, out of our awareness so much. Um, we felt that it was not necessarily negative, that it's a, it's a sort of an automatic reaction to something, unconscious. Um, and sometimes it's acceptable in society. Um, so it's not, it may not be a negative reaction to something and it may not be a negative concept, but it, it's sort of built in. That's what we came up with. Okay. Good. Diane. Well, I really liked um, Carolyn, I think, focused it for our group. Um, so Elaine and Carolyn, um, I, I think that we would agree that implicit bias comes from the emotional center, um, unknown emotional center, and from there, bloom uh, racism, stereotyping, and so forth. And those are the actionable um, concepts the concepts that provoke, uh, that, that are the actions that come from um, implicit bias. Okay, who, who else? Have time for one or two more. Well, well, uh, well, well in our group, we, we came up with a couple of different examples. I, I share with um, with the group that my daughter and my wife are what I call my HGTY uh, people because they're always trying to refinish things like that. But at one point in time this summer, they needed an, uh, a circular saw. And the guy across the street had a circular saw, but he wasn't home. So they said, we're going to have to wait until he comes home and go get a circular saw. But in reality, we have a same-sex couple who lives next door to us, and they have a same-sex saw, but they didn't think of asking them for the saw they so that's an example of implicit bias to me like mm -hmm. they, it was it, it was natural for them to, to wait and, and the guy across the street without really thinking that the women next door 
had a circular saw that they, and actually that's what they got to use the saw with. So that was a, that was an example of, of, of an mm -hmm. implicit bias. In terms of stereotyping, so implicit bias is more, we thought more covert and uh, uh, stereotyping and prejudice is more of an action oriented. The example we gave with that was if a white woman was walking down the street and she saw a group of black students or black kids coming down, she clutched her purse. Well, why would she clutch her purse unless that was a stereotype that she had been dealing with before? Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Um, and I think we've all, we've all come up with some pieces of what we are talking about and how we see the difference between um, implicit bias and stereotyping in um, racism and um, whatever the third one was. Oh, prejudice. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we're going to now go through some, um, Sue's going to do some kind of introductory comments and I'm going to do some review of implicit bias. And I think we'll bring more out around this, the answers that we have to this question as we go through that. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Sue, to yeah, that, that was a terrific discussion, and you, you brought up several different things. And just to give us a starting point, I want to acknowledge that bias is a normal part of how we function in the world. It's baked into being human. We as humans need to get things done and create safety in our world. Our decisions about people and what's happening need to or feel like they need to be made very fast often. And bias makes that easier. Of course, the problem comes when we are making decisions or operating out of untrue perceptions and incorrect ideas. Because our culture is swimming in white supremacist culture, heteronormative and gender binary superiority concepts um, in misogyny, our implicit bias can take us way off from our intentions of fairness and justice. We can veer away from our intentions and cause real harm to participants and mess up the mediation or peacemaking that we're working on. Because these biases are implicit, hiding out as facts or just how things are, we have to actively bring them into our awareness and into the awareness of our co-mediators. Co we need to recognize that the impact is much more important than our intentions. Intentions are good things, and I'm sure all of us here, I would, I would guess that all of us here have very good intentions. However, it's the impact we need to look at. We need to have the humility to know that we are going to get things wrong. It's just comes with the territory and the perseverance to make sure we do the work to cease or mitigate harmful biases. Today's agenda is to increase our understanding of implicit bias in mediation, peacemaking, as well as other areas of our life through discussion. Um, today you're going to participate, we're hoping you will participate a lot more um, everyone here has, um, oh, we have, in this Zoom, we have people who have more or less experience looking at implicit bias. And everybody here has got something to offer. If you're a person who normally comes really, you know, comes out and, and talks a whole lot, hold back just a little bit so that we can encourage other people. If you're a person who kind of holds back, come forward a little bit because we would really like to hear and you can you can actually help the other people in this this zoom we will we'll get a bit of experience with how to move forward individually and with others who you are working with to live up to the ideals and justice of justice and fairness that benefit everyone All right, thanks, Sue. I, I'm going to spend about five minutes 
um, reviewing a few of the concepts that Sue has just introduced, and then we are going to spend the majority of our time here. Um, we have some examples to um, offer you and for discussion, and we're also very open to having you bring up your own examples. Um, and we appreciate there were people who filled out a survey, and if you were one of them, we appreciate that because it helped us come up with what we hope will be useful examples. Um, so that's the, the bulk of the session today is to, to use to share your own thoughts and expertise and um, wisdom around how do we handle things that may come up in mediations or in circles that um, that may have implicit bias going on. So um, we pretty much already um, identified implicit bias. Uh, I will say that in this context, although I may have an implicit bias for strawberries over blueberries, that's really not the, what we're talking about. We're here to talk about the kinds of bias that come from or, um, stereotypes, prejudice, and um, racism. So um, those concepts that we grow up with, whether we want to or not, because they're all around us, they're in our policies, they're in our um, laws, they're in our healthcare system, they are everywhere. They um, sometimes come through our family or they come through friends or school. They just, so, you know, we cannot help but absorb some of that. So it's really not about whether we're good people or bad people. It's, you really have to kind of erase that whole thought process and just say we are all, um, as Sue said, we all have implicit bias. We all have gone through this culture. If you're from another society, you, the stereotypes or the ideas that have come through will, will be different. Um, but there's, they will still be there. Um, and when we come across a situation, um, sometimes some of those old um, ingrained beliefs or attitudes or emotions rise to the top because that's just human. Um, and so what we are after here in dealing with implicit bias and preventing harm is to recognize it. It's not to say we'll never do, oh, I'm never going to have any of those come up. That's just not true. We all have them come up. And they tend to be the things that we don't consciously believe. So in this kind of, of setting and what we're talking about, um, the ideas of the of feeling unsafe or the idea of somebody being not as smart or the idea that you know if somebody speaks differently that there you know is um that we make a judgment about that all of those kinds of things come up like that and what do we do about them so recognizing them being open to feedback and um being willing to take responsibility when one of those happens and being willing then to apologize if it's appropriate, to ask or to find out what we might be able to do to repair any damage or harm that's been done, how we can change our behavior so that we are more are able to try to, you know, if something rises up, how do we keep it from kind of spilling out? And the more aware we can become and the more we practice, the better we get at doing that. Um, so, given all of that, uh, we would like to start giving you some examples and encouraging some conversation here. Yeah, so the first example did come from somebody um, on the survey, and it's your co-mediator says to a participant um, of Asian ethnicity, you speak English really well. First of all, can, can somebody tell me what's, why that's problematic? Because I don't, I don't know. No, I actually, I know, but can, can someone share? Because they're assuming that 
this person has, they're assuming a lot of things, right? Probably that where they grew up or what their education level might be or um, any number of other things. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have something to say on that? Um, so, yeah, and it's a way it actually others the, the person, um, the Asian person to, oh, you're, you, you are something foreign. Um, so how would you address it with your co-mediator? Or how would you address it in this session? Or would you? Take, take a risk to be wrong. It's a big important part of this work. <laughs> Elaine, I see your hand. Yeah, so I, I was thinking that um, my first impulse would be to hold it and and talk about it in the debrief after the mediation. But I also, then I immediately thought, well, that's kind of a cowardly thing to do, and it doesn't help create a more open, safe atmosphere within the mediation in that moment. And I was, I'm wondering if there are some words that could be both respectful to my co-mediator, but also help create this safe environment um, for the mediation. Go ahead, Margaret. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I'm safer that way. <laughs> you only think um, <laughs> I think I might ask everybody to go around and introduce themselves and talk about where their heritage is and um, to take the focus off of the Asian person and bring everyone in and let everyone talk about their heritage and then assuming that the person who speaks, who looks Asian, but who speaks English well, um, is an American Asian person, um, then make honest apologies. What do other people think about that? Do you I think that would like land well? I don't like that one. I don't like that. I yeah. feel like that, um, I think that that would other them even more by saying, let's talk about our backgrounds there because it's, um, you know, presumably they're not in this meeting or circle or mediation to talk about their background necessarily. Right. And if they've just had this slight, which is going to happen regularly for them, then to have to then go into explaining where they're from and what their background in background is. Right. It's like, it's the additional questions that happen every time mm -hmm. when someone doesn't get the initial clue that maybe they messed up, right? Um, mm -hmm. It feels like badgering the point rather than addressing it or letting it go. And yeah. I say that because I've, I've seen this happen multiple times in my right. family. Right. Yeah. And my, you know, my mom gets this almost every single time she talks to people and my sister and brother do too. And it's very, um, you know, if, if for that, it's, it feels less intrusive to just be like, let it go. And then maybe apologize later if it's a thing or just address it and not have it happen again. Mm-hmm. So I have an example of what I would do, but I know is not the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, examples are good too. <laughs> um, if somebody says something like that in my presence, I tend to try to diffuse it with humor. And so my initial thought was being, oh, so do you. <laughs> you <see? laughs> and then maybe like uh, joke, like laugh a little about it and, um, and then say like something along the lines of like, but for real, like we shouldn't be commenting about how people speak, right? <laughs> you know, this sort of my, I try to 
I think it's not always appropriate. Humor is not always appropriate, but it's like my initial go-to. Sometimes, sometimes it does work really well. How do people, other people feel about that one? I like it. <laughs> I actually like it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you were going to if you were going to speak to your co-mediator afterwards, how would what would you say to them? I saw Greta's <coughs> hand go up. I'm sorry, I didn't see. Oh, sorry. I just I would ask Carolyn just to jump back a second or two. Yeah, <coughs> Carolyn, what would your family members like to see happen? what would they feel would be appropriate on our part? Because my initial reaction would be to pray that whoever, that the Asian person fires back and says, of course, I went to the University of California, duh, you know, or something. I mean, <clears throat> sometimes you just don't have the energy to have to put that up again, right? Um, but I think that it really depends on each individual and each family, right? Like my family would probably really appreciate the humor and be like, huh, that's funny. Nice that you got them back, right? Um, but other people might not appreciate that. So I don't know. So how would you address your, your co-mediator if you waited till the end and talk to them during the... I, I wonder if I might just ask some questions. You know, I noticed that you made this comment. What were you thinking of? Um, you know, what was going through your mind when you said that? You know, listen to what what the answer is, and then and maybe probe a little. Um, you know, how do you think that went over? Or you know, did you notice um, what happened after you said that? Or how do you think that affected? the mood of the mediation. You just sort of try to get them to explore that a little bit with me first. Mm -hmm. And then and follow up, depending on what, what is said, to follow up and say, here's, here's how I responded to what was said. And then you know, get, get a reaction on that. OK, Nusheen? Did you have your hand up? <clears throat> Thank you, Sue. Um, hi to everybody. Um, you know, as a person, as a, I'm an immigrant and I've been here in this country for 32 years. Also, I see myself sometimes that even in a lot of Zoom calls, um, when I want to introduce myself and just that, by the way, the accent that you're hearing, I'm Iranian. So it could be some of the internal implicit bias that I might have toward myself or just the, if satisfied the sense of curiosity that some people might think that, oh, um, I speak a little differently, so where I might be from, so I explain it to them. But um, I just wanted to be sensitive to the fact that even um, if you think that that Asian person might be um, impacted by it, just um, to just to arrive with a little bit of the care and then with the warm curiosity to just say that, um, would you be willing to just, um, you know, to hear some feedback? Um, because sometimes it might even trigger me more if I'm just, you know, upset by that comment that somebody come at me and just want to talk to me more. I might not be in that space to just really receive that, even that it's, it's coming from a place of care. I would like it for the sense of boundary to just someone just said, would you be open if I just talk to you a little bit about it? And then that gives me the choice that if I just say that yes, or just you no, know, I, I need some space to myself to just um, to, to comfort myself a little bit. So also with the mediator, the co-mediator also that, you know, just come back with the question that, would you be um, would you be open something that it happened that it was a it was kind of a trigger for me and then I would like to share it with you would you be open to hearing that so there was an impact on me so just also just come with the, the sense of like permission and give them choices so 
that's that's mm -hmm. fine. Thank you. Okay, let's let's move on to our next example. Okay. Um, so you notice your co-mediator being more attentive to one party in a mediation, maybe through eye contact, body language, um, kind of giving them more time to speak or whatever, and you're concerned that there's some implicit bias going on. How would you, how would you handle that? Both during the mediation and afterwards. I would think that it, that it would be important to address that pretty early in the mediation. Um, I mean, if that's actually going on, because <clears throat> the neutrality of the mediators is just so important and essential to a mediation actually being effective. So um, I'd be tempted to caucus and just talk about it with my co-mediator and see if something is going on. So just for my information, caucus means you would take a break and speak to separately with your co-mediator. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. What do people think of that or other, other thoughts? I, I agree with that approach. I think um, if, uh, if it looks like it doesn't have an impact, I wouldn't address it, but if it looks like it's affecting the mediation and our independence, then I'd call for a caucus. I would do that. I'm so glad that you use caucuses. It's terrific. Craig? Oh, I, <laughs> I first oh, thing Craig I, said, Craig. Okay. Oh, Go ahead, Craig. I'm sorry. I saw Craig's hand, but I'd like to hear from you too, Greg, so. Well, go ahead, Craig. Okay. Uh, yeah, just the first thing I would do as soon as it seemed like there was any difference in how much people, the participants were talking or being asked to talk, I'd just say to the, to the other one who wasn't talking so much, I'd say, oh, I'd really like to hear from you on blah, blah, on whatever the question is or on some other topic. And then just, as a first step and then if it keeps getting if my co-mediator keeps putting more emphasis on the other person then resort to something more drastic like uh talking to them privately in a caucus <laughs> i you know i i would say um it, it really kind of depends on your how well you know your co your co-mediator your co uh your co-mediator because hopefully um, hopefully you, you've worked with them enough so that you, you could look at them and say, you, you could look at them with your eyes and say, they could kind of get the impression like, uh oh, something is wrong here. But <laughs> if that didn't, if that didn't work, then you, obviously you probably have to um, say excuses, we need to caucus and then go address the issue. Say like, why, you know, it, it appears to me that there's your, your, uh, your um, favoring or you're giving more, attention to this one particular person and then but i would hopefully i would hope that um that early on did you with your do you work well you know your co-facilitator well enough that at some point in time you could just you know like you, you do as a couple you, you look at each other and like um something's not right here <laughs> okay thank you that's some some good ideas i want i, want, I have a question Going back for a second to the um, the first example of you know somebody saying to somebody you speak English really well would that be a situation where you might caucus or you might immediately do something or is I mean that, that would probably happen right at, near the beginning of a session I would think um, so I was just just curious. And I'm curious to know, would that bring more attention to it? Now, we might need to address it. I don't know. I don't know the answer. You know, would it be better to address it right then and there? Or maybe not. I wouldn't want to, um, you know, emphasize it, really call it to attention. 
I don't know. I don't know the answer. I'd love to. If you know the answer, please tell me. Oh, I, I expect we're not going to find answers to everything today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but raising questions is useful. Yeah, Craig, go ahead. Yeah, I just noticed uh, Jillian had a very good idea, I thought, and she put in chat. She said you could use the chat on Zoom. So if you're in a doing using Zoom for mediation, you just send a private direct chat to your co-mediator and just point out what you want to point out and not make a big deal of going off into a caucus or something. It's a good idea. That's great. Advantages of Zoom. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Diane, please. I um I think just uh, debriefing afterwards. Uh, one time, one of my co-mediators um, noticed that it felt my um, opening, allowing people to talk, tell their own story, perhaps went was a little bit too long. So it felt like there was preference for that party, even though we had just started and which I was horrified because, you know, feeling like there really needs to be balance, but it was a really good call out to me to make sure, you know, I tend to get really focused and want to get through to the end of something. And it reminds me that we need to, um, uh, give example to the parties of how to go back and forth. So to keep, so I've started saying things to the parties. I'd want to hear your out, an out, a brief but thorough outline so they get the drift and then I try to, so that I don't, um, uh, you know, we can go further into detail later. So for me, that feedback was extremely powerful at the end from my uh, co-facilitator. Okay, so a real point in favor of being up, just being right up front about what you see with, with your co-facilitators or mediators that could help them adjust their behavior. So let's, shall we go on to the next one? Yeah. So your co-mediator asks a young, uh, black participant if he plays basketball and a young white participant if he's planning to go to college. How do you address that? Any ideas? I'm not seeing hands. Ah, Nancy. <laughs> I'd be so horrified that that would come out <laughs> that I think I initially I would be totally speechless. Um, you know, a lot. Of, I was thinking with the previous discussion, it might be easier with mediation because we have the caucus opportunity or um, option to address some of these things than it is necessarily in peacemaking, um, where it. It, you know, I think it would be handled differently, but I, I think I, that would that would be something that would be need need to be addressed immediately. Um, and again, I go to caucus with you know, the, my co-mediator and and talk about it. So, Greg. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, uh, so as to not. Um, sometimes you, you, we've said before, so as to not draw attention to it or make it uncomfortable, I would simply say to the to the the other person, well, um, what sports do you like, or do you participate in any sports? In other words, you know, yeah, okay, so the black guy, it, it was kind of he must be very tall or whatever, whatever, whatever. That's why he asked the question, but but so to um, to give credibility to the process, I would just say to the other white guy, do you play any sports or what, you know, da da da. And then to the black guy, are you planning to go to college too? So that way it also alerts my co-facilitator that, you know, this, you know, he might they might want to check themselves on that, but it also makes less um, awkward the whole situation. Yeah. Wow, I like that. Um, 
and I think it does have to be addressed pretty quickly mm-hmm. because it's it's just <laughs> off balancing, and it could continue throughout. Mm-hmm. Um, any other ideas anybody has? Anything you want to say about this? Am I missing anybody? Mm-hmm. I okay. think it's. I think that in addition to Greg's idea, you know, about using your role as a co to balance it, but also then addressing it afterwards um, directly with your co-facilitator saying, oh. look, I noticed this and um, this was something that you said and that can, that, you know, sounds biased and can certainly impact the participants in a negative way. So I don't know how much thinking about bias and pointing it out as um, afterwards when you're having your your debrief about a session is kind of built into your structure. But I guess that's a question I have. And is it something that you feel like you would um, note when it happened? And would, and I don't know if you're making, I assume you're making notes during the sessions and maybe you can make notes of things that you want to make sure to bring up afterwards. How, how does that part work? I, I guess for me, doing the debrief, I would simply say to the guy, why would you ask him, I mean, I, why would you ask the black guy if he plays basketball? I mean, like, that's just so, um, that's so out the pocket. I mean, like, why would you, why would you assume that he plays basketball? Or, on the other hand, why would you assume that the white guy is going to college? Good point. Good point. Well, I, if I could just make two comments here that I'm, I've been thinking about. One is I echo what Diane said about about being brave to actually raise some of these issues with co-mediators, and that's that's great. And I, my first comment is, for all my prospective co-mediators out there, please raise these things with me. <laughs> if you hear me say or do things, please do give me the gift of that feedback by all means. The other comment that I'm thinking about is if that kind of thing, as Greg says, such an out of pocket kind of thing, so obvious uh, a stereotype, if that goes unaddressed, I, I, you know, I feel like there could be reputational issues for the DRC. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if we become known as, as mediators who really, you know, mediate with that level of bias and stereotype, you know, that can't be good for us. Linda? Yeah. Um, Thank you, um, Elaine, for that comment. I think it's a great segue into what what I'm thinking. Um, I've been at the center for a very long time. Um, I've worked with, I think, everybody on the screen in some capacity as a volunteer and even as board members. Uh, partners in, pro- in program development with the Connors. Um, so there's, you know, all of you have played an instrumental part in helping the DRC be where it is today um, and how we're viewed and, and the, the respect that we get, but also the confidence that people have in our ability to help them during some t- very often the most crisis uh, pr- moment of their lives. They're getting a divorce. They're dealing with family changes, they're dealing with the legal system, the criminal system. But I think to Elaine's point that we all have to get prepared or find a way to be comfortable with the idea that we can have these tough conversations, not in a antagonistic, I think that's the word for it, not to be um, not to be in, in a nasty way. I'll just use the simple language that I'm most comfortable with. Um, not to be nasty or unkind, but as the DRC continues to grow and, and while, you know, the case numbers may not reflect all of the growth, the conversations do that I, that are happening in the background, building out these programs, relationship building that we do, the requests that we get asked 
for workshops and this and that. Um, it, it really is beyond the mediation that many of you do um, for us. And now we're on Zoom, so we don't get to see each other very often, um, if at all. But I, I do hope that as we have these kinds of conversations, this, this lunch and learn and other things that we do, that we are building our internal muscle to be comfortable in having these uncomfortable conversations. I'm asking the DRC staff to create space in that debrief for these kinds of things. We're doing lunch and learn here. There's something happening with the peacemakers that Carolyn and Kyoko does. It's skill building as well, but it's also helping us develop that internal muscle and that insight apparatus that we need so that we can do a better job of managing ourselves, but also feel comfortable in getting that kind of feedback with the understanding that no harm is intended. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've been saying this for a number of years and it's actually coming. We are going to be working with the criminal legal system. Who's overrepresented in that system? I'm not making it up. The data tells the story. So that means we will work with people who are very different from us and, and folks that are easily, that can easily be stereotyped, can be marginalized, that can be ignored in such unusual ways. We can do it explicitly and directly. We can do it unconsciously and indirectly. So it's important that we're able to do that. But, but I just wanted to underscore Elaine's point. You know, she's, she's saying I'm comfortable getting that kind of feedback. I want to say that I'm comfortable getting that kind of feedback um, as the executive director. If I'm screwing up and stuff, because I know you all, I have worked with you all, I believe that you have the best intentions at heart. So if I'm side, you know, going left in how I direct the center and am I ignoring people and how we put things on our website, social media, the language that we use. You have to, I have to depend on you all to, to call us out on that. We try to do that internally, but this is a collective and we have to be, you know, collectively responsible for how we uh, deliver our services. And, and we want to do it in the most humane and responsible way that we can. Yeah. Thank the you. accountability. Thank you. For the thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That, that creation of a, a culture in which you can normally it's it's it becomes normal to speak about the, such things is absolutely essential thanks mm -hmm. okay. so i think we have one more example but i have a question if that's okay if i can jump in here, which is, is, is there a way um, to bring, to model this kind of bringing this forward with actually within a, a, a mediation or a facility, circle facilitation? I, I, and I'm asking, I don't have a preconceived notion about the answer to this, but if somebody said something that was concerning to you, is, is there a way to say, um, whoops, I think we need to talk about bias here for a second. Or um, I, I don't even know what you would say, but can you imagine a way that you could actually bring it up in front of the parties and, and in some circumstances? Alexandria. I, I, going back to what Belinda just said, there may be a person designated, say in DRC, who is incredibly discreet, and any one of us would be able to tell that person if we perceive that something did not go well. And, and that person would be reporting to Belinda, uh, rather than to just bring it up at an arbitrary uh, you know, mediation, or to say it ourselves and we might actually harm the person feeling and they won't want to work with us anymore, that kind of thing. Could there be some point person designated who would just take even anonymous tips from the mediators saying, so-and-so seemed to be a little off base on that particular mediation. Could you look into it? 
Um, because I think the less people that know, the better it goes away. And the less that we pressure somebody in front of the very people we're trying to mediate, I think it's better to just either have, a, like, he's, like a Gill Gillian said, a, a little sense of humor, or see if it'll just go away. Because uh, I think you can do more harm and get away from the real topic, which was the mediation. You're trying to get these people to actually settle something. You don't want to distract them too much. So I don't know what you think of that, Belinda, because you've got enough on your plate already, but maybe you've got somebody in your administration who is very discreet and could be trusted to be quiet that we could actually tell them when we think one of our co-mediators was kind of stepping across the line. Yeah. So we don't have a designated person, but I will say that I trust all of the center staff, um, those who coordinate the cases. They have the most intimate knowledge about the case anyway, uh, because they've done the most work in setting the case up. Um, we have these kinds of conversations as a staff all the time. The de you know, Since my time as director, I've hoped that I've made a, a, an environment or created a or facilitated or fostered a culture where we can talk about these unpleasant things. Um, you know, you all know I'm black. Um, I, I am impacted by all of the horrors of our society, uh, even things that feel very far away. Um, so we talk about these things very openly and candidly. And just as a technical point, the staff, we have all signed off on a confidentiality statement as a part of working at the DRC. So we, I think we have put our structure in place pretty well where any volunteer, if you're working on a case with Gail, I, if, I, I suggest that you start with talking with her. And you don't know if she needs to bring me into it or not. We communicate all the time. We meet weekly. We, we do a, we've done a great job of staying in touch during this pandemic. So you can do that. You can talk to Gail. You can, Gail will talk to me. She'll bring me into it. And if you're not comfortable going to Gail, you can always contact me. You all can reach out to me via email. But I, I want to make it clear that as a staff, we work very closely, very cohesively. I don't do this by myself, and I don't pretend to do this by myself. Um, I would not be able to do it by myself. It is the team effort. So I want everyone to feel comfortable with any member on the staff. That is our collective responsibility to keep the center going. And so um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Carolyn? Carolyn? And I want to add that I, you know, there are times when I can see where you might be uncomfortable speaking directly to your co about something that they brought up and you might feel more comfortable taking it to staff. And I think that that's a necessary layer to have. But I think that it's important that we build that ability to talk to each other directly, to have those conversations directly with one another. And if that's not able to happen, then that's something that we need to think about within ourselves, about whether it's a block that we're having to be able to have that conversation with someone else and then address that. Um, and if it's because of their behavior, then maybe we need to talk about that as well and our reaction to that. Um, but I think that talking to each other as co-facilitators or co-mediators needs to be the first thing that happens. Um, and to your question, Layla, about how you might do it in, the, in a circle or in a mediation, just to kind of model the behavior that we might want to be seeing, um, especially if you see you know, a, a participant having some discomfort with what was said, I think it's fair to, to say, you know, like, hey, um, that that comment made me feel a little bit uncomfortable and I want to share, you know, why it made me uncomfortable. And I was wondering if maybe, like in a circle, we might then just do a round, like, um, did that affect anyone in any way? Um, but I think just talking from your experience about how it affected you would be a good way to get that started. And I think that also um, highlights how important it is to talk to your co before you get into your mediation or facilitation about how you're going to address things like that, right? How are you going to address difficulties? Um, because I have had co's who will not talk 
directly in a circle or in a mediation about something that's happened. They are not comfortable with that. So we call a break and I talk to them. But most folks are comfortable talking about it there and that's important to know ahead of time. Thank you. I saw Phyllis's hand. Um, so I've always felt comfortable going to the staff person involved with the case. Um, if I had a problem with a co-mediator. So I, but I think it's really important that, um, I, I would think that everyone who is a volunteer mediator or facilitator knows that about the DRC. Maybe it has to be stated again. I, I you know, there have been so many new people coming on, I don't know how the training has changed, but but I think that's, um, uh, it's been there. Um, I had another thought, which has, which has left me for now, but um, if it comes back, I will, I will share it. I think I do think that um, saying I like the idea of, of trying to be able to model for the parties that something was sounded inappropriate, say to me, and it may not feel sound inappropriate to other people, but um i think it is it can be helpful and, and i, I Layla, your your question about how do we say it i don't know <laughs> um i guess it depends on what is said um you know sometimes that colombo question style of gee i just am wondering how that felt or what was that all about? I don't know. Um, but if things go on too long, um, th it, it could impact the rest of the session and the DRC reputation. So I think it, as long as it's a given for all mediators, and circle keepers to know that we all have these natural um, implicit biases and sometimes comments come out and they will be addressed. And it's, it's, it's a gift. I like that term also. It's a gift. And um, because we're, we're all learning and we're all trying. So. Yeah, I, I want to bring forward, there's something in the chat that says, um, could we craft a checklist for both mediators to review afterwards for personal reflection and for conversation with each other? Um, maybe there is such a thing. Um, I'm assuming that on that checklist, there would be a question of, did you notice anything, any thing that might possibly be implicit bias. I'm, I'm thinking there might be something out there because this conversation is becoming very regional. I'm a part of a regional conversation in oh, Michigan. Wonderful. And I know that nationally practitioners are talking about this a lot. So I'm just guessing that someone has developed something that will aid in us having those uh, kinds of debriefs. Mm -hmm. I, I have a template that I can um, share with you, Belinda, and you can decide if you want to share that with folks. Okay. And, and we can maybe modify it together and as a group. Okay. And then let's see what else. Oh, um, another thing in chat was if the bias um, is expressed between the parties that 
it might be able to become part of the issues that need mediating. Um, so, wow. And let's see, if someone notices verbiage in oneself, be brave enough to bring it up oneself. Um, another chat message. Uh, I wonder if, oh, here's the wording. I'm always into the wording of how do you say, how do you bring something up? What's, what, have a, have a phrase or three in your back pocket. Um, and here somebody says, you might ask, did you notice, or I wonder if you caught that I said such and such, or I wonder if you caught that you said such and such, I, uh, that I was uncomfortable, um, or, you know, there's, there's, you know, a, a very kind of innocuous phrase can be really helpful to start something like, like, um, would you mind if I asked you a question, or would you mind if I, if I talked to you about something that I noticed during the mediation? I mean, it's just, so I just encourage all of you to think about what what's an easy way sentence or question you can start a conversation with that would feel comfortable coming out of your mouth. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left. So I want to model consulting with my co-mediator here, my co-presenter. <laughs> um, we had one more question or one more example, and I don't know. If, what do you think? Should we? Go yeah, I that? don't. I don't. I don't know. We already did move into the going forward quite a bit. Yeah. So we could uh, we could take a little time for that. We don't actually have 15 minutes. I have another call at one. <laughs> All right. So you have to right. You have to be out of here immediately. Yeah. Unless I mean you can continue without me, but you know. <clears throat> so we started to talk about how to. Um, look for implicit bias and other harms and to create an atmosphere where feedback is expected and expected. Um, and how you encourage yourself to be open and thoughtful rather than immediately defending your behavior. Um, any other thoughts about that? That's kind of was our ending um, set of questions. I do want to say that implicit bias, um, you can lessen it. It can, you know, it's not stuck there. The more that you, um, the more that you learn, the quicker you catch on, you know, when you start to fall into something. Um, it's, it's really a journey that goes a lifetime, you know, and, uh, at my age, especially, you got to get going. <laughs> There's not that much time. <laughs> I would share um, in my experience in giving feedback to mediators, you know, that was in the constructive category or, you know, calling out something. Um, I would say the response has almost always been that they were, and I've tried to be kind and gentle and supportive and all that in my delivery, but when they were so mortified at their personal behavior and, you know, at, the, at, you know, at, at it. Um, and, and I, and I say for me, I need to, you know, just being prepared for that mortification and how to help people deal with that is something too. I think it's a great point, Dan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? We can end a few minutes early too, but I just want to make sure anybody else who has any, any ideas about how to take this forward. It's been a great discussion and I really appreciate so just about everybody has participated, and I, I, that's wonderful. Um, and you may have more ideas that come forward after the session is over. I hope you will. And mm -hmm. um, think about how, how do you want to carry this forward? And we yeah, have it? talked a lot in staff, as Belinda and Carolyn said, and Stephanie, you know, just about how to, you know, we, we all do the debrief, I know, as the mediator coordinator, I, you know, 
sometimes we really do it and other times we end up chatting, you know, that we, you know, it needs to, you know, really be part of our always regular system and that there is a lot more that we can do to um, make it easy for people to have difficult conversations and also to help people be able to hear that. And I think we've talked about Carolyn's checklist and modifying that and, you know, sharing that and just reminding everybody about the expectations during um, mediations and facilitations and, and that the whole part of the debrief as well. Oh, Nushin, did you have a comment or a question? Um, yeah, it was kind of um, along the same line of, you know, what you were saying. Um, in terms of um, making it more normal, you know, for us as mediators to just have conversations with each other, uh, that could be a difficult conversation and make it okay. It's okay to have these difficult conversations and to bring things up and then more of the education, you know, it's going to make us more comfortable education. NDC has a wealth of resources about um, how to handle difficult conversations, how to deliver it. And I know Sue and Leila, both of them, they do have, you know, workshops, you know, around difficult conversations too more of um you know getting the information and make it it, it it's going to make it easier for us thank you yeah really really good point and a good point i think to maybe to kind of end this mm -hmm. conversation on which is that the, the more you do this and the more you kind of you know bring that courage muscle into play and for and exercise it um the easier it gets so I really want to thank you all for participating and for inviting us back. Yeah, thank you so much. You. Conversation well, thank you to Sue and Layla. Thank you so much. Uh, so appreciate um, your coming back and really appreciate everything that you all do. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I've sent if you we only have a couple extra minutes, but maybe you could use that and complete the evaluation survey for me. I would really, really appreciate that. I'm also looking for a couple volunteers to help me plan the curriculum for next year. And I would really love a couple folks to chat with about that. Um, uh, so that survey is in the chat. I will send it around um, to everybody and also resend Layla and Sue's presentation. Um, our next session is on Wednesday, June 1st. That'll be the last one for this year. At that session, uh, Zina Zumata, who many of you know, will be uh, coming back and giving us a skill building session. What she's going to do is she's got... Um, a really great video of a real mediation by a really great mediator. Um, and so it's the, the video is about 20 minutes. She's going to, you know, show bits of it. Then we'll stop and, and chat about techniques that were used and things that were done. So remember our new email addresses at the DRC. Um, anybody have any comments or questions before we say goodbye? Well, happy spring, everyone. Um, yeah, May. It's May. Okay. <laughs> stay, stay healthy and safe, and uh, thank you for everything that you do for the DRC.